It was on a late night in January 1961 when police arrived at the scene of a terrible accident on Sunset Boulevard. A reckless driver was speeding around the windy road known as Dead Man's Curve and collided into an oncoming Aston Martin. It was a near fatal collision. An hour later, medics were able to pry open the car door of the Aston Martin and rescue the driver inside. The man was barely alive and was rushed to the nearby UCLA hospital. Only upon arrival did doctors realize that this man, an unassuming actor, was the voice of Bugs Bunny. The chances of his survival were a thousand to one. Mel Blanc, the most recognizable voice in the world, faced the greatest challenge of his life. But that's not all, folks. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Mel Blanc, but most of you probably know me by several other names. Show them, Bugs. Show them, Mel. Roll BPR1. Mel Blanc. What an amazing guy. What's up, Doc? <laughs> oh, goody! You can't look at the Warner Brothers characters without hearing his sound, his voice. Launch! There's such a delight to the sound of his voice in every character he did. What'd I say? What'd I say? Think about it today that everybody imitates these characters. He created them. Gosh, what a crazy, screwy duck. That, my little cherub, is strictly a matter of opinion. Mel was so unique at what he did. Mel had the range that everyone wishes for. I think it was a shock when I got older and discovered all those voices were one man. His voice was like more powerful than a human body could contain. Open that bridge, Farman! Open it, I say! So it seemed to be coming out of every part of him. <laughs> Mel Blanc had this phenomenal voice box. It's the only way I can explain it. He just did all kinds of things that were just amazing. He didn't just do voices. He played characters, and there's a difference. I he was just able to do that, to just totally, like, you know, animate with his voice, to create a complete three-dimensional character just with his voice alone. I oh, say, that's no chicken, son. I'm a chicken. Rooster, that is. How can you beat a pair of vocal cords that had an eight-octave range, perfect pitch, great singer, and an incredible actor? There's Mel, and there's, like, everybody else. There was nobody better than Mel Blanc. You know where is it, a cat? Howdy doody. <laughs> About that egg. <laughs> Melvin Jerome Blank was born on May 30th, 1908, in San Francisco, the younger son of Frederick and Eva Blank. After leaving New York to seek his fortune prospecting in Alaska, his father eventually settled the family down in Portland, Oregon. As a young boy growing up in the melting pot of the American West, he would be forever affected by the sounds of people and the way voices define personalities. My dad was always interested in voices and in music and in singing and in entertaining. He started to entertain in grammar school. From around about the age of 10, Mel Blanc was um very interested in dialects, Yiddish dialects, and Chinese and Japanese dialects, Russian. The school would have an assembly, the grammar school. I would entertain the kids with a dialect story or one of the diff a different dialect each time. And uh, the kids loved it, and they got such a big kick out of it. They laughed, and the teachers laughed, and then gave me lousy marks. You know? <laughs> I took eight years of violin lessons. And when I went to high school, I thought to myself, gee, I want to march in the band, but I'd look kind of stupid walk, walking down the, with a violin. So I took up tuba, and uh, I would march down the street with a, with a high school band playing, playing the tuba. I know he produced vaudeville shows in high school up in Portland. He dropped out of high school in about the ninth grade. I used to say, I got lousy grades, but uh, I, I developed some great voices because of the 
echo in his school in the hallways. He started leading orchestras. He was an orchestra conductor, and the orchestras moved all around the Oregon area and the Washington area and Northern California area. In between when he was conducting the music, he would do shtick. He'd do different voices and different comedy routines. Mel was the youngest orchestra leader in the country at that time, at 17. So by the time he was a young man, he was already an accomplished entertainer. I think my dad never thought of Hollywood when he was young. He thought of going on the radio when radio was quite new at that time. Well, Mel came from the world of vaudeville and radio, a world that's that has long disappeared. Most people don't even know what it was like. In those days, radio was a much bigger business than, than movies. I mean, people forget that, that radio was the single most driving force in you know, American popular culture. And of course, radio is ideal for a, you know, a schooling for someone who was going to do cartoon voices. <laughs> Rising talents like W.C. Fields and Milton Berle had a big impact on Mel, who was slowly gaining experience performing on the air. In 1932, he made his first trip to Los Angeles, hoping to find his break. Instead, he met a young woman named Estelle Rosenbaum, a bright and attractive girl who would become his biggest supporter for the rest of his life. Mel and Estelle married that spring and quickly found themselves back in Portland, writing and performing their own radio show, Cobwebs and Nuts. My dad played a hundred different male characters. My mother played all the different female characters. And uh, they had a great time, although they were only paid $15 a week to write it, produce it, and voice it. Times were tough for the Blanks. While his radio show was meagerly successful, Mel considered resigning for a life as an insurance salesman. Thanks to Estelle's encouragement, he decided to follow his dreams and return to Los Angeles. So when he came down to Los Angeles, the big radio people like Joe Penner, Jack Carson, Jack Benny, these were great radio actors, and he thought he could become a character on one of their shows. He had no agent. He would just knock on doors and see if he could get a job. He made the rounds uh, of all the studios trying to get uh, to do his voices. It didn't get him anywhere, and especially at Warner Brothers, he kept knocking at the door forever there. I had seen some of the Warner Brother voices, sort of, or heard some of the voices on the, in the cartoons, and I thought, geez, they're, they're missing out on an awful lot. The voices are pretty bad. Usually, Norman Spencer was there to greet him. I said, I'd like to audition for you and show you what I can do. He says, sorry, we've got all the voices we need. I said, but Mr. Schlesinger said that you were the one. He says, no, I'm sorry. And he said, no, we've got enough voices, because they could use all the voices that uh, uh, that were available who were extras and things like that. Well, I was as stubborn as he was, and I went back in two weeks, and I said, look, won't you just listen to me? He says, I told you, we have all the voices we need. So I was still as stubborn as him, and I went to him every two weeks asking him to please listen to me. And he says, I told you a hundred times, I've got all the voices we need. So he kept knocking on the door for two years. Finally, in March of 1937, Mel's perseverance and a little twist of fate allowed him the break he desperately needed. It was probably the week before Christmas. He came looking for a job, and that day, Treg Brown was sitting there. Treg Brown, brilliant sound effects man for the Warners cartoons. He happened to take over when this fellow passed away that wouldn't let my dad in the door. Treg Brown was um, very established by that stage uh, in late 1936 as the um, sound expert and cutter for the cartoons and uh, had originally worked for Cecil B. DeMille. My feeling is that he and Mel Blanc just hit it off immediately because they'd both been musicians with big bands. And, uh, you know, musicians have that kind of kinship, like it's just like an unspoken um, thing that they get. And I said, Mr. Brown, I've been trying to get in here to audition, just have him hear me. But the guy kept saying, no, uh, I've got all the voices we need. He says, well, let me hear what you do. So I auditioned for him, and he got a big kick out of it. He said, would you do it again for the directors? I said, gladly. Mel's first audition, according to Treg Brown, was doing his crazy news reporter, where he did a whole bunch of dialects and one dropped his cornet on the floor and then did his crazy hiccuping character. So they recorded these hiccups and some of his famous woo-woos, which were used by some of the directors in the soundtracks before he actually got a real job as doing dialogue. Tex Avery, 
the leading Maverick director at Warner Brothers, decided to give Mel a shot in a supporting performance in Picador Porky, a new cartoon featuring the studio's latest popular character, Porky Pig. He said, uh, I've got a cartoon coming up with a drunken bull. Do you think you can do the voice of a drunken bull? I thought, geez, it's my first assignment. I hope it goes over, you know. So I said, yeah, I think I could. He says, how would he talk? I hear him talk like it was a little, and we were looking for the looking looking for for the sour max. He says, "Great, great." He says, "What are you doing next Tuesday?" I wasn't doing the damn thing. I said, "I think I can make it." The Warner directors quickly recognized Mel's vocal skills. Not only did they ask him back, but they offered him the prized role of Porky Pig himself. If, of course, Mel could perform a stutter that didn't eat up too much film during the recording sessions. He says he's a timid little character. I told him, well, I want to be real authentic about it. So I went out to a pig farm and wallowed around with the pigs for a couple of weeks. And I come back and they kick me out and so go home and take a bath. When I did, I come back, I said, if a pig could talk, he'd talk with a grunt, you know, oi, 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 that's the way we a pig, a porky talk, with a grunt. I said, oh, great, great. It's the guy from upstairs. In that same cartoon, he introduced a, a kind of embryonic version of Daffy Duck. Hey, th 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 that wasn't in the s s uh, script. Uh, 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 don't let it worry you, Skipper. Uh, I'm just a crazy darn fool duck. <laughs> now, here's a guy suddenly doing the craziest, most energetic voices they've ever had in one cartoon, and I think that that's when they suddenly thought, I think we're going to hang on to this guy. There was another two years where he was still establishing himself, but, yeah, I'd say by 1940 he was becoming very well known in the industry. The decision to cast Mel as the voice of Porky Pig seems like destiny today. Perhaps it was serendipitous. No doubt it was groundbreaking. For as soon as Mel assumed the role, Porky became a star, and others soon followed. Voiced by Mel and guided with manic assurance by a crack team of irreverent artists, the Looney Tunes characters would populate the cinema and bring about a revolution in the medium. My dad had a rare ability to look at a character, a, a model sheet of the character, and realize what type of voice that character should have. First they would show me a picture of the character that they wanted to use in the cartoon. Then they would show me what they call a storyboard. This is what this character is going to do throughout the cartoon. It's very thrilling when someone shows you a picture and the artists and the directors are sitting there and they go, what would you do? Porky Pig and Daffy Duck may have propelled the studio and Mel to success, but it was another character, a sly and wisecracking rabbit named Bugs Bunny who would become his most famous and indelible creation. They showed me a picture of this little rabbit, and he's going to say, hey, what's cooking? I said, instead of him saying, hey, what's cooking, why don't you have him say, hey, uh, what's up, Yonk? That's the, the new uh, expression that was uh, being so popular. And I said to Mr. Schlesinger, I said, why don't you name him after the guy who drew the first picture of him? His name was Bugs Hardaway. Why don't you call him Bugs Bunny? What's up, Doc? It's a wabbit down there, and I'm trying to catch him. Well, they told me that Bugs was a tough little stinker, and I thought, what kind of a voice can I give him? The tough character, maybe Brooklyn of the Bronx. So uh, I put the two of them together, Doc, and that's how Bugs Bunny came out. Pardon me, but you know, you look just like a wabbit. Uh, come here. Listen, Doc. Now, don't spread this around, but, uh... Confidentially, I am a rabbit! Mel had an instinctive ability to create both a specific voice 
as well as a unique personality to any given drawing. Over the next 20 years, Mel would give life to nearly the entire Looney Tunes cast of characters. They have pretense, foppish as I am, I might be the Scarlet Pumpernickel. Daffy is not a lisp. People say Daffy lisp. No, he is spraying the water out of the <laughs> lips. It's not a lisp, by the way. I thought I got a itty bitty pudgy cat. Tweety was a little baby bird. So I gave him a little tiny baby voice. Ooh, I thought I saw a pussy cat. And Sylvester was a big sloppy cat, so I gave him a big sloppy voice. Suffering fuckers ass. Speedy Gonzalez was a little tiny mouse. Gracias, señorita, mi amor. Adios, hasta la vista. <laughs> and he had to talk fast because his name was Speedy. So I gave him a very fast little voice like this. My name is Speedy Gonzalez. I did just wait for him to give it to the mouse. I think he talks so fast you can't understand what he says. I think. Just to think, Radiant Flower, you do not have to come with me to the Casbah. We are already here! He chased the pussycat and catch them and kiss them. I gave him more or less of a French voice, like so, a voila. And uh, I said all the French words wrong, you know. Now all of you skunks, clear out of here! Yosemite Sam, they showed me he was a little cowboy. And he was only two feet tall with long red hair and had to be recognized, so I had to give him a, a recognizable voice. So I gave him a real loud voice, like so. My name's Yosemite Sam. <coughs> this is one that almost gets me every time I use it. Mel's characters were these fully formed or almost fully formed crazy original voices that had a quality that nobody had ever heard in animation before. He had vocal cords like Enrico Caruso. The doctors have said he never had a sore throat in his life, yet he smoked, you know, never had a sore throat ever. The characters would morph a little bit from decade to decade depending on who was directing him. You know, some wanted it crazy, some wanted a little lower key. Other studios soon called upon Mel for his unique services. My golly, it's a great old world. MGM was quick to offer roles, as was Walt Disney, who cast him as Gideon the Cat in Pinocchio. But perhaps his most famous non-Warner voice was Woody Woodpecker, which he created for Walter Lance in 1940. Guess who? And I remembered in school that I had a crazy laugh. I used to do it in, in the school, in the high school, and run down to the end of the hall to hear the echo. It would just echo all the way around, never knowing that this would turn out to be the voice of Woody Woodpecker. It would just say, <laughs> Just added that little pecking at the end. Of all the characters that Mel created, Bugs Bunny remained the fan favorite. The rabbit became the world's most popular cartoon character almost overnight, and it's easy to see why. Arriving on the screen only months before Pearl Harbor, Bugs quickly became a symbol of strength in the face of cunning adversaries. Partly why Bugs Bunny struck such a chord is because he sort of reflected how tough the times were, and here was this wisecracking bunny that could overcome all these crazy odds just with a lot of uh, courage and humor. The tall man with the high hat will be coming down your way. Get your savings out when you hear him shout, and he bonds today. Come on and get him, folks. Come on, skip right up and get him. An important thing that Bugs did was uh, to help the public service when they were selling bonds. And he, had a, he sang a song called, uh, Any bonds today, let daddy do 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 Buy bonds now, don't forget that. Because of what was happening in Europe and, and, and the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, audiences just found his sassy control of the situation just so heroic. Coolness in the face of danger. Hey, what's up, Doc? What's up, Doc? Listen, stranger. This town ain't big enough for the two of us. It ain't. Like many Hollywood stars, Mel used his talents and his celebrity persona to endorse support for the armed forces during the war. He worked tirelessly with the USO, 
whether it was performing live on the GI Journal, washing dishes at the Hollywood Canteen, or giving life to wartime characters such as Sad Sack or Snafu, Mel Blanc actively found a way to serve his country. Turning now through pages in G.I. Journal, we come now to another one of your favorites. Hello, young man. I sort of remember you from someplace. You're, uh... I'm a lieutenant, a colonel, a private sad sack. Oh. <laughs> another chapter in our story, the life of sad sack. <laughs> I got hundreds and thousands of letters from troops saying, gee, keep up the good work. We love you. We love your work and, and uh, keep on doing it. By the early 1940s, Mel Blanc's star was on the rise, and so was his family. Estelle gave birth to their son, Noel, and Mel decided to ask for a justified raise. He knew how much he'd contributed to the Looney Tunes' success, and so did his boss, Leon Schlesinger. What Leon offered Mel was ultimately a deal money couldn't buy, an unprecedented arrangement for any voice actor. Sole screen credit on every cartoon produced by the studio. Mel, for about 12 years, was the only person in cartoons to get screen credit. What that did for him, that made him a celebrity. People in the business went to movies too. And they saw these cartoons, Mel Blanc, gee, Mel Blanc, I guess he's the guy that that... And so he managed to make up the difference uh, on the, the, the other jobs that he did outside. Disney felt that it spoiled the illusion if audiences saw that a human being had done this cartoon character. Another school of thought is that that's not the case at all. It's simply that if we give them credit, they'll want more money. <laughs> It has impacted a lot on cartoon voice acting, and it's very important now that people do get credit. When his voice characterization by Mel Blanc went up on screen in the early 40s, it's the same time that the radio people started utilizing his name in the credits. Jack Benny started to put him into the credits, Abbott and Costello, George Burns, Gracie Allen, Dagwood and Blondie, Amos and Andy. He was on every show, Jack Carson, Joe Penner, and they started to use his name at the end of the credits. Also on tonight's show were so-and-so, so-and-so, and Mel Blanc. He was doing 14, something like 14, 15 network shows a week. By 1946, he had had so many supporting roles in series and semi-regular parts that he decided to consolidate and spend every Tuesday doing cartoon recording for Warner Brothers and concentrated on four big-time radio shows for which he was contracted. Jack Benny was the leader because it was the most high-rated comedy show for which he played many cartoony sort of parts, like Jack Benny's Parrot, and the Judy Canova show, the Burns and Allen show, and the Abbott and Costello show. And it was, if you listen, if you tuned into them, it was like listening to a Warner Brothers cartoon without the pictures. My dad was usually home for dinner, but he worked hard during the day because he was running from ABC to NBC to CBS. They were all in the same area. They were all around Hollywood and Vine, Hollywood and Gower. And he'd run from place to place, not getting to eat lunch or anything else. They'd run him, they'd throw him a script. He knew the character that he was supposed to do, and he'd run on stage and do it. They just knew that he'd come on, and he could just pick up the script and go straight on the mic and know exactly what he was doing. That was amazing to me, to see him do that. So he was really established by the mid-1940s in, in a big-time capacity. I'd like to have you all for dinner at my house sometime, party. Yeah, I'd like to come. Good. Shall we say Monday? I can't make it Monday, but uh, I can make it Tuesday, Friday. <laughs> Along about 1947, 46, 47, they said, Mel, why don't you do your own radio show? So they gave him a chance to do his own radio show, which was on the air for two or three years. Uh, that was a little much for him, doing all the other shows plus his own radio show. His own show, and I, I think he would have been the first to admit it, it just wasn't as successful as his supporting roles because uh, it was almost like he was better as a second banana to a lead comedian. Um, it was hard to find a hook. He played a straight character called Mel Blanc in this show who ran a fix-it shop. My grandmother and grandfather wanted something to do. They, weren't, they were tired being retired. So my dad said, well, why don't we open a little store in Venice, a hardware store, and call it the Mel Blanc Fix-It Shop, and you can run it. Well, you couldn't have asked for a better thing because it was national publicity called the Mel Blanc Physics Shop, and here it was, a store in Venice. Well, that store was so crowded because they came in to see Mel all the time, 
have them do all the voices, and they'd always buy a pair of pliers or a monkey wrench, a can of paint, whatever it was. And they had a line outside the store all the time. It was a little store. So it was really a lot of fun for him and my grand folks. Mel loved his job and the parts he played. He might have been just a voice man, but he never took a performance for granted. Mel Blanc was an amazing character actor, um, an amazing actor, running the gamut in seven minutes from pain to joy to tears to hysterical laughter. And this is all one guy who's just, uh, as some people would say, a funny voice man, but he was way beyond that. Some people probably can't see past the fact that he was broad and the medium in which he worked was animated cartoons, which at that time were crazy. But if they take the time to analyze what he's doing, uh, there's every human emotion under the sun, and there is not one line in one of those Looney Tunes where he doesn't hit the exact meaning of those words, gets all the beats perfect. His timing was outstanding. You know, you can be, you can be a comic, and if you can't, if you don't have the timing down, you have the best material in the world, it's meaningless. You know, you're walking around in a circle. And you don't learn that. Nobody teaches you that. Very well, you rotter. I'm gonna tackle you a capello. I'm brown as a nut and fit as a laugh. Toy with me, will ya? Why, with my fierce energy? Oh, oh! Do not take it amiss if I slap you silly! It would be a bit rough on the slasher, but the foolish cove asked for it. It's the acting. People say, oh, Mel Blanc, the man of a thousand voices, greatest voice man that ever lived. One of the best actors to ever come out of Hollywood. People don't take the voice person as seriously as they would like the, the Olivier's or Dustin Hoffman, De Niro, but you know, to say, you know, Olivier De Niro, blank. It sounds weird because of what genre he worked in, but no, he was a brilliant actor. Oh, I'm starved to death. I mean, it's absolutely astonishing that he do all those different characters, and they're alive and they're real and they're very unique. There were ne never characters like that before Mel Blanc came along. Are you with really, really, really the last of the dodos? Yes, I'm really the last of the dodos. It always, I always thought Peter Sellers learned everything he ever knew from Mel Blanc because he said, Sellers would always say, once I got the voice right, everything else falls into place. And somehow Mel Blanc must have been like that. You get the voice right and everything. Then the animators have to work around that voice. There. Now I won't be able to get the bird. Oh, Mr. Pudgy Cat, don't you like me anymore? I, I think, I think, I, I think you're, I think you're delicious! He's completely believable within each and every one of those characters, and he imbues them with so much, like, nuance and so much subtlety. I mean, it, of course, it really, you know, mirrors what the animators themselves were doing with the characters on screen. He just puts so much personality into them that... You know, even though you know it's Mel, when you hear him talking as Bugs Bunny, you know, you just say to yourself, it's Bugs Bunny. Round and round she goes. There's a winner every time. Watch your numbers, please. And it stops on Lobo, the sign of the wolf. There's the answer. Unlucky at cards? You must be lucky in love. Ew, you kid. 23 skidoo. <laughs> Chicken inspector. Somebody one time said about Mel Blanc, a truth that very people people recognize. He said, Mel Blanc has a thousand voices and all the same. It's true. We never had Mel talk through his nose or talk like this or talk like this, any of that junk. Bugs is a straight voice. When he spoke it, it was always as Mel Blanc acting a part, just like Sir Alec Guinness or Laurence Olivier. Think about it. They never, they never changed the timbre of their voices at all. What they did was step into the part and become the character. It was Blank, the total actor, who immersed himself into the role to the point where he would physically alter according to who he was playing. You could turn the, vo uh, the sound off sitting behind glass in the sound booth and watch him do Yosemite Sam and know that it was Yosemite Sam. You didn't have to hear him because he became the character. He would 
expand and pull his body back if he was one of the explosive characters, like Yosemite Sam. He would shrink in for Tweety Pie. He would become, I think, a disheveled <laughs> wreck of a creature if he was doing Sylvester. You would just live the part of whatever character you would play. And Mel was the best at that. He really was the best. He was a method actor. The term method acting came up in the 50s, and I think Mel almost jocularly said, I'm a method actor because basically he was, but all those years before that, he'd never really intellectualized it. He just did what the method acting teaches you to do, which is become a character. There was not much uh, process about it, you know? He was just gifted and, and instinctive. I'll tell you what I think Mel Blanc's geni most genius achievement was, and only if you're a voice actor do you realize how incredible this is. When Bugs and Daffy are fighting over whether it's rabbit season or duck season, and Daffy Duck comes out dressed up as Bugs Bunny doing a Bugs Bunny imitation, then Bugs Bunny comes out dressed as Daffy doing a Daffy impression. Yep. What's up, Doc? Having any luck on those ducks? It's duck season, you know. Just a darn minute. Where do you get that duck season stuff? You know how hard that is to do, to take your own character, have it imitate another one of your own characters? It's almost impossible, because if you try to, like, combine two voices that you're doing, you kind of just land in the middle. Like, if I try to do Apu imitating Mo, it'll sound just like Mo imitating Apu. There's no... We tried it one day at The Simpsons. We were talking about how we were marveling at Mel Blanc's ability to do this, and we all tried to do one of our characters imitating another one and have them sound different, and we couldn't do it. You know what to do with that gun, Doc. I'd say, you know, Dad, you're an incredible actor. I said, here's a picture signed by Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. Says to the greatest actor I know, Mel Blanc. I said, Jack Benny used to call you a great actor. Did you know you were a great actor? He says, No, no, I'm not really. I'm a voice person. But he didn't realize that was acting. He never took an acting lesson. Now, Chuck Jones and and the other directors and the writers would attend all of the recording sessions, and I think that working in tandem that way especially over such an enormous long period. The combination of Mel Blanc and these gifted directors and writers was like a well-oiled machine. It's a concerted effort. You're just not some maverick that comes in and goes, hey, listen to this. You know, you listen to writers, directors, and producers, and they were, every picture you see of Mel, like, working with, they were all around him. They're showing him stuff, and they're, you know, and here's how the music's gonna be in that scene, and he, he understood all that. They all worked together. Mel really had a lot to do with the character becoming popular, I think. But many times I thought about, wonder if we'd use somebody else instead of Mel. Would the characters be just as popular as they are today? And I thought, well, Mel did other characters too for other studios. They're not popular. I think it's a combination of what we did and what Mel did that made it. Mel never saw the pictures until or any other actor ever saw the pictures until about an hour before we recorded them. We'd call them over and then I'd take my drawings and go through the entire picture. And then I would do, I'd go through the film and I'd do Bugs Bunny and he'd do Daffy Duck. And then I'd do Daffy Duck and he'd do Bugs Bunny, see. Mel was brilliant, there's no question about it. He's the fastest study I've ever known. But he appreciated the fact that the, that the director knew what the hell he wanted. Now, Bob McKimpson, who wasn't much of an actor, worked probably more loosely with Mel than, than, uh, than Fris or I did. He gave credit to all the people who were involved at Warner's in putting these remarkable pieces of film together. Uh, the animation directors and Fris and all the people that we all know about, but the writers and the music guys and the people in the, the ink and paint departments and the character designers. When you work with voice actors, some of them do outrageous performances before and after the session, you know. And I mean, and they're on. Uh, Mel wasn't on until it was time to be on. And that was from my experience. I had never met Mel Blank before I worked with him. I had seen him at the halls of NBC when I was doing radio shows, and he was on the Jack Benny show. I had seen him walking up and down the halls be between rehearsals and the shows. And then when I met him, I was, uh, I was awestruck, really, because by this time, I knew all of the things that he had done. When we worked, we did our lines separately. But in Broomstick Bunny, when I finally got to see it, you'd swear we were talking to each other. Come on, come on, drink it, drink it. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I forgot. I'll, uh, I'll have to take off me mask first. 
mask. There, that's better. It's like working with God. If you could say, would you like to work with God? Yes, well, Mel Blanc was God in the business of animated cartoons. When he was through recording, he'd come into the studio and uh, there'd be a crowd around him and he told us stories in every kind of dialect. He was always very funny and just a regular guy. My dad was an actor that considered every cartoon important to him while he was doing the cartoon. But once he did his shtick, we'll say, and completed the cartoon, he let the animators and the director put it all together. And a lot of the cartoons he never saw. He loved being the characters. But he wasn't a cartoon guy. He was more of a people person. He loved entertaining the kids with his voice. But sitting around and watching cartoons, he really didn't do. In any of his cartoons, Mel's chemistry with his fellow actors was apparent. Perhaps none more so than with Arthur Q. Bryan, the inimitable voice behind Elmer Fudd. I will do it with my spear and magic helmet. Your spear and magic helmet? Spear and magic helmet. Magic helmet? Helmet! Magic helmet? Magic, magic yes. What? <clears throat> it's a shame. That was going well. So they almost I don't it. think I'm right yet, and I'm going to kill the rabbit, am I? That's a boy. That's fine. Okay, kill it. Mel and Arthur acted out the clash between Bugs and Elmer for over 30 cartoons in 20 years, until Arthur's death in 1959, when Mel reluctantly took over the distinctive role. Friz Freeling, one of the directors, said to me, uh, Mel, will you do a couple of lines for, uh, for Elmer Fudd? I said, you know I don't copy things. I, uh, if I can't create them, I, I don't uh, do, do them. So uh, he said, well, it's just a couple of lines. He says, I've tried others and they can't come close. He said, just can you do a couple of lines? I said, oh, I don't why, but I don't know if I could do it or not. <laughs> he says, that's it. So I also became Elmer Fudd. The truth is I'm lucky. I work with actors who give 100%, so it's only natural that I give 100% back. I've always been grateful to you for that. So have my fellow actors, Porky, Daffy Duck, Tweety, Hey, and don't forget Bugs Bunny. Oh, I had to bring up the rabbit, didn't you? Let's see what's cooking on TV. When television overtook the airwaves in the early 50s, many radio stars transitioned to keep up with the times, including Jack Benny. The Jack Benny Show quickly became one of the most watched shows of the decade. And for the first time, Mel Blanc's face was as recognizable as his voice. Will you please try and be a little more quiet? Look, bud, I'm in no mood for complaints. What's the matter? What's the matter? Did you ever spend three hours looking up at the bottom of a rusty sink bowl? <laughs> well, no, I haven't. Well, it ain't no Van Gogh, brother. Mel was modest about his fame, and he enjoyed his private life. He made friends with everyone he worked with, and many remained close for the rest of his life. But it was his friendship with Jack Benny that Mel cherished most. Wednesday night used to be ping pong night. So ping pong night used to get all the people that were on the radio show, uh, Lucille Ball and George Burns, Gracie Allen, and Jack Benny and Jack Carson, they'd all come out and play ping pong. My dad would make them soda fountain drinks, and then they'd go home. So dad and, and Jack Benny became really good friends over ping pong and those nights out at the house. And then up at Big Bear, they became very close friends. Jack was a wonderful man. He wasn't only my boss, but he was one of my best friends. They were constantly corresponding with one another via telegram in the old days and by letter in the later years. And I cannot tell you the jokes they would play on one another and the innuendos and the laughter and the two of them they were contagious i mean it just they fed off of one another my dad and jack shared so much laughter together in fact a lot of the programs that you watched on television where jack would do a routine with my dad he would break up start to laugh and almost fall off the chair because he laughed at my dad so much <laughs> Even when they were on the radio, you could tell that Jack was cracking up. 
and these guys were trying to be able to pull each other out of their characters. My dad, however, was able to keep a straight face during something funny Benny would say, which would crack Benny up because he kept such a straight face. So they had the great communication on and off stage. Animation, both for the big screen and the small screen, is what we tend to remember Mel for. Then, when you delve a little deeper and realize how many plates he had spinning, you know, radio and television and recordings. You know, Mel Blanc had hit recordings, like chart hits. I Taught I Taught Putty Tat was a chart record. Believe me, Floyd, this is one of my best sellers. <clears throat> And he had albums featuring Bugs and Daffy that did very well. Say, young man, would you like to buy a Bugs Bunny album for your lady friend? E, E, cheapskate. And he wrote a song called Big Bear Lake with a Motorboat Zapatin. It got popularized on the radio and became a hit song. And because it was a hit song, and because Dad loved Big Bear and was all the cartoon characters, of course, they made him honorary mayor for 33 years. I mean, he has to have more stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame than anybody, right? Because he did everything. By the late 50s, Mel's accomplished career in entertaining was unparalleled. From platinum records to his five Oscar-winning Looney Tunes performances to the debut of the ever-popular Bugs Bunny show on TV, Mel Blanc was on top of the world. In uh, January of 1961, my dad had a recording session in Hollywood, and he didn't show up for it. And my dad was never late for any recording session, ever. My mom called me, I was with friends, and she says, Dad didn't show up at the recording session. She says, wait a minute, the other phone is ringing, we had two lines. It was UCLA Hospital saying that he had been involved in a head-on collision on Dead Man's Curve right above UCLA, and they had taken him to UCLA after they had, cut to, they had to use a cutting torch to get him out of the Aston Martin. It happened that a kid driving a, a 98 Oldsmobile, a great big car, ran into a small Aston Martin sports car, and it just folded up. They didn't expect him to live for the first 12, 13 days. I went to see him, and it was really, um, I, I was shocked because he was wired up with all kinds of gadgets to keep him together. Noel told me that almost every bone in his body was broken. He was unconscious for a long time. Finally, a doctor got an idea because my dad had a television in his room and it was playing Bugs Bunny cartoons. So the doctor went over to the bed and clapped his hands and said, Bugs, can you hear me? Bugs, can you hear me? My dad goes, what's up, Doc? The first words that he, e that he uttered were of Bugs and saying, what's up, Doc? Then he says, Porky, can you hear me? And he would answer me, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can, you know, I can hear you. Dad, so he brought him around doing the characters' voices before my dad was fully awake as, as himself. So my son Noel told me, he said, you know, no, uh, Dad, he says, Jack has been here every day that you've been in the hospital waiting for you to come out of your unconsciousness. And he, uh, when he couldn't get over here, when he couldn't drive here, he would call me and I would go and get him and bring him here to the hospital. And, uh, that's the type of man that Jack Benny was. He was a very wonderful fella. Later on, they wanted me to do the voice of, of Bugs Bunny when Mel had that terrible accident. I said, no, I'm not gonna do his voice. Just wait till he gets well. And later on, Mel heard that I had done that. And I think he was deeply appreciative that I didn't try to do his voice while he was sick. I know we got a lot of calls from agents you know, you know he, he isn't dead, you know, and, you know, but anyway, we, we did get a lot of calls. I remember that. He was a guy who lived in the moment. I think he put value in every day he spent on this earth. And whether that came from the accident or whether it was always there, um, he certainly gave that impression to me. I, you have to be changed by it. Uh, I think he was very grateful that he was able to come through it. I, I know when he talked about the doctors and the nurses at UCLA that he never he never forgot what they did for him 
and the fans because he got cards and letters and phone calls and flowers and constantly from all over the world. Is he okay? How you doing, Mel? That, that affected him. He was out of commission, as I remember, six months, maybe a year. But what we did was, uh, to get around this problem of a track, we made cue tracks, we made temp tracks. You know, Frizz would record, Chuck would record, whatever, just to have something to animate to. And then when Mel was able to come back, we looped it and, uh, you know, got his voice in. So for a while, when he started to be able to work again, we had to go out to his house, take the sound crew out there to record because he wasn't able to come into the studio. Warner Brothers brought over a big soundtrack and he was able to continue on with the cartoons because there were so many Looney Tunes artists and directors and everybody, sound people, all working on the cartoons without a voice. My own feeling is that ever since that accident, which really did nearly kill him, uh, it coarsened his voice. He always had a naturally coarse speaking voice, but there were lingering after effects from that accident that did affect him. Um, he walked with a cane forever after, and uh, I think uh, it just weakened the rest of his performances. Flintstones, meet the Flintstones, they're the modern Stone Age family. Mel literally woke up to a new revolution. The enormous success of the Flintstones, directed by pioneers Bill Hanna and Joe Barbera, paved the way for animated cartoons on primetime television. Hanna-Barbera wanted to get all the good voice actors together and have them do everything all the time for scale. <laughs> because they were operating on a shoestring. It wasn't full animation. It was limited animation. They were shooting on twos and threes, not single animation frames. And they needed to do it cheaply. And they had to do them quickly. And they had to produce a lot of television shows. So they put together a great, great repertory group of characters. And my dad was one of those. We were using radio, television, people like that. The actors themselves, like Mel Blanc, created characters for us. So did Dawes Butler. They'd come up, what can you do with a voice like this? When Hanna-Barbera asked him, we're, we're going to be doing the show called The Flintstones, it's kind of a takeoff on the honeymooners, he said, I don't do impressions. Barney Rubble's like an Ed Norton sort of, I don't do impressions. So he was able to create a character that pleased him as an artist more than pleased the producer as, as an impression. Oh boy, wait till Fred sees my new bowling ball. It'll bring my score up to at least a hundred. Strike. <laughs> They'll call me Twinkle Toes Rubble, the terror of the alleys. <laughs> Strike. <laughs> boy, what a ball. Uh, the voice of Barney Rubble, yeah, I did the voice for him. And, uh, you know, it's a different voice than Art Carney. But uh, they said, do a voice like Art Carney. I said, no, I won't do that, but uh, I'll give you this voice here. I'll take the same inflections that he uses and uh, a slow laugh at the end. <laughs> and, of course, he was Mr. Spacely in the Jetsons. Send up Jetson, Miss Gamma. Oh, yes, sir. Ready, Mr. Jetson? Uh, right. Well, good luck. Oh, uh, sorry, Jetson. I've been meaning to have that chair fixed. Uh, anyway, I've got a surprise for you. Yeah, I just had one. Throughout the 60s, Mel found time to perform hundreds of voices for Hanna-Barbera, including wacky races... Uh, the perils of Penelope Pitstop... <laughs> that's not a litterbug purse. That's Penelope's purse. <laughs> Oh, oh. McGilla Gorilla. Oh, finished, Mr. Ricochet. M Mr. Ricochet. Secret Squirrel. You sent for me, Chief? Ooh, secret. Oh, uh, sorry, Chief. But in my business, we never trust anybody. Why, even you might be an imposter in disguise. Captain Caveman. I am Me get him. Hmm, bad time for energy crisis. And for a short time, even the voices of Tom and Jerry. Every 
session, Joe Barbera would choose somebody to pick on. And he would pick on dear Dawes Butler, whom he loved. But he'd say, no, 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 Dawes, not right. Got to hear the words. Got to hear the words. And he would pick on Don Messick, and he'd pick on me. He'd say, well, Janet, you know, what else have you got? But he would uh, never, ever pick on Mel Blanc. It was sort of a hands-off thing with Mel, because I think he respected him. He knew Mel would come up with something brilliant. He just left him alone. But he'd always compliment him and say, great, great, Mel, that's it, right on the nose, great, great. Even he said, you know, it's, it's certainly not like the great days of the theatrical cartoon because they're, they're a little more sausage machine because uh, the medium was totally different. But again, Mel would just do his best. But I don't think any of the characters he did in the later years of his life uh, had the staying power of anywhere near, anywhere near the staying power of the uh, immortal Looney Tune characters. Everywhere you go, everybody knows to love Bugs Bunny. They don't know Mel Blanc, but they know Bugs Bunny, and everybody knows that. He took great delight in, in that, the fact that people loved the characters that he did. I cannot tell you the quantity of fan mail he received, and something really, really phenomenal about him. That man answered every piece of correspondence personally. He would call people. He'd get a letter. Oh, it's my daughter's birthday. She's turning 12. Her favorite character is Tweety Bird. It would be so terrific, sir. You know, if you ever have time, could you call my daughter? And Mel would call. These people from all over the world and literally wish them happy birthday or happy anniversary or whatever the, the, the celebration was. He would say, what do you think of this voice? And I'd say, well, that's so-and-so. He'd say, yeah, but I want to do it this way. What do you think? He was always testing it on Noel and myself, other kids that came over, because he liked to talk to the kids. He bought a CB radio, and he'd do shtick on the CB. He loved to talk to people, to communicate, to do the voices. Uh, his handle was Bugs Bunny on the CB radio. And say, Bugs, you know, little kids would get on, how are you, it's my birthday, and my he, Bugs would sing to him. And this is after he had done the cartoons or been in the studio and everything, he'd sit at the CB radio for a couple hours, an hour from five to six before dinner and talk to the kids. He just loved to do it. When he lived in Playa del Rey or Pacific Palisades, kids would come over every day and say, Mel, can we have your autograph? Do some voices. And we'd have kids at the door, I mean, literally every day. Halloween, we'd have 1,500 to 2,000 kids. And he'd give out signed little autographs and candy. The kids would always go to Mel and Estelle's house because they never knew who was going to answer the door. You know, Bugs or Porky or Peppy or Daffy or Wiley or Roadrunner. You never know. So it was, it was great to watch that. It was really, really wonderful. The longer I'm in this business, the more I feel that we, we really are very lucky people. Because in a strange way, we attain immortality. And if you judge immortality by the pleasure that you've given to others, I would certainly say that Mel Blanc is one of the greatest of the immortals. He did so much for children. When they grow up, their lives will, will be tough enough. So in your youth, you have to make life more worthwhile. I think that's important. And Emil Blank was a genius, genius at that. The kids love what he did, and they they love the characters that his voice created. I've seen him at parties sit, a, sit in the corner with like a, a, a little kid or an adult or a series of adults, whoever would come up, and Mel would just sit there and talk to them, and they, he knew what they wanted. And so he'd do Bugs and Daffy and Porky and Sylvester and what, whoever was their favorite character. We'd be out to lunch, for example, and he'd be ordering. And we're just ordering it. All of a sudden, he'd burst. He'd, he'd break into Porky Pig, ordering a hamburger. Once he started speaking in a character's voice, regardless of where he was, you know, people hear it, and it would just create, you know, an ocean of people that would be surrounding him. I mean, he always made time for people when he was in public to 
do whatever voices they called out to him. Thank you, Mel. He never, never said no to anybody that was a fan of the cartoons. He did a series of college lectures back in the 70s. And, of course, the colleges, he had attendance records, broke it really at every college he ever went to. But on the side, and he didn't do it for publicity, he made sure that every city he was in to do a college lecture, he went to a children's hospital or a hospital where the children's wing and so on, and would go through and just visit with the kids. Because he knew all the children loved the Looney Tunes, and he wanted to be there and do all the voices for the kids. We did uh, a special for the Shriners Burns Institute called Ounce of Prevention. That became a 30-minute uh, television show, and that was distributed around the world. You know, kids, the kitchen ain't a playground. There's a lot of danger hiding in here. What do you mean, Bugs? I mean, there's a lot of things in here that can burn you. Like what? Uh, he was just a very giving person. That was part of his nature. He devoted a lot of time in burn units um, for ailing children. And I think he really had a great effect in doing so. And even if it made him feel better for just a minute, he did. We had to try to get him to leave, first of all. I mean, he would spend all day doing it. I mean, there would be times I would say, you know, Mel, we've got to go. It's getting dark, you know. We've, we've got to get back on the road. And or Noel would do that. I mean, he was tireless. I mean, the man was like the Energizer Bunny. And when there were children and children, you know, in that situation, he, um, you couldn't get him to walk away. If I saw a person smile, that to me was payment in itself. And, and uh, uh, if I could make them laugh when, when they had been very sad, it, it was great payment to me. Thanks, Jennifer, for helping us tell the story. Thank you, bud. Oh. <laughs> Say that again. I'm starring, of course. I sound like you. Because <laughs> I'm your offspring. Oh, that's right, my offspring. I that's forgot. right, Doc. Hey, that's right. You look like a rabbit. That's too. right, Doc. Hey, that's pretty good. <laughs> I'm suing you. Noel Blank remained at his father's side throughout the 60s, and together they formed Mel Blank Associates. This was in part to develop better product for commercial advertisers, but more importantly, to expand opportunities that would benefit Mel's career and the careers of other up-and-coming voiceover talents. My dad and I worked together for about 30, 35 years. He took my direction, strangely enough. But I didn't ever try to outthink him because he always knew what he had to do. I need one Yosemite Sam line uh, before you go into that, and that is right back here. Noel was really a very good director, really capable of, of getting the best out of performers and mechanically really adept at cutting the tape, putting together the packages. So it was a perfect mix. I would say that was one of the greatest things that ever happened to Mel, because I felt that uh, Mel, through his early years, was taken advantage of. And then as the son grew up and Noel uh, got in the business, he had somebody there that really took care of him. Mel and Estelle enjoyed their autumn years together, preferring a quieter lifestyle than most celebrities. It had been nearly 20 years since the Jack Benny show was on the air, and people had forgotten the face behind the famous voice. That is, until a certain commercial aired in 1982. Do you know me? I gave Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck their voices, but no one knows me. It's despicable. So now I travel with the American Express card. And this is... This, like, round old man suddenly said, he's the guy! <laughs> so he gained a whole new generation of people just from one powerful TV commercial which went international. With this, my name won't always draw a blank. He was in the theatrical feature Roger Rabbit in 88. He was still doing work for Warner Brothers in their merchandising division. Financially, he may well have been able to retire, but uh, it's still what he said back in high school. I just love to make people laugh. And he needed to do that and he needed to keep working. He always wanted to be working. I mean, it was just part of who he was. I don't think it felt like work to him at all. It seemed so easy, and it just rolled for him, and he always was in between takes, you know, laughing and cracking jokes with everyone, and no, I don't think it was work for him. I think it was second nature. 
I just love it. I love my work, which I think everybody should love before they do, before they go to work. They should love what they're going to do or don't take the job. And I, I love my work, and uh, uh, although it was a hard time getting into it, this has worked out beautifully for me. That's marvelous. Thank you. God bless you all. <laughs> and now I'll make a wish. That you all should live to 80, and I'll make a private wish. I already done that. And make it come true. <laughs> Mel Blanc happens to be a great actor. It's more important than that. I'm happy to be here to celebrate his 80th birthday because Mel Blanc is a great human being. I wish you a happy birthday. That's one of the things that was beautiful about Mel because he, he never thought about himself as a, an icon in the business, although I'm sure he, I mean, he wasn't a fool. He knew how great he was. He knew he was exceptional. But he always approached every, every job as an opportunity to do something really good and new. And not just because he was Mel Blanc. And so you didn't get any of the star treatment nonsense or any of the you know, prima donna aspects of things. And for that reason, too, he was working all, almost to the day he died. Mel was a tireless actor. Whenever his voice was needed, be it in Daffy Duck's Quackbusters or the Jetsons feature film, Mel Blanc was committed to his characters. In July 1989, when Mel agreed to star in a new commercial for Oldsmobile, neither he nor Noel would realize that this would be his final performance. Is that any, is that any good? Yeah, we are the new generation of Olds? Yes. Yeah, that's pretty good. We're the new generation of Olds. The director there is out pulling his hair, but we're going to do this commercial anyhow. What hair? <laughs> oh, he's got... <laughs> it's that one. It's not the art director. Well, how would Yosemite Sam say this? We are the new generation of Olds. In, look, in the, look at the dealer right there and talk to him. We are the new generation of Olds. Now you heard that, you better believe it. We are, and we're going to try to do this commercial, but it's tough. Anyway, we got this director... Tough, he says. <laughs> Very simple. We've only been on it about 27 hours. We had shot the Oldsmobile commercial all day. It's not your father's Oldsmobile. And uh, I said, Dad, uh, you're coughing a little bit. Why don't you go to the doctor and get your lungs cleared out? The doctor called me and said, yeah, Mel's over here. I had to shoot uh, the tail end of the commercial. So I was still on the commercial, and my dad went over to see the doctor. He was through, and the doctor says, well, I can keep him in the hospital overnight or just give him a, a, some, an inhaler to get the cough out of it. My dad said, no, let's stay in the hospital overnight. It was a mistake, of course. He fell out of bed. They forgot to put the bed rails up. He broke his femur, got fed emboli into the brain, and was basically gone in 48 hours. He was still at the height of his career. He could still do all the voices that he could before, and he was still really terrific. Mel always used to say, uh, when I buy the farm or when I, uh, you know, catch it, he says, uh, I'll go when I go. He never worried about death. The man who was the voice of Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, and hundreds of other cartoon characters has died in Los Angeles. Mel Blanc was 81. Here's ABC's Gary Shepard. That, that it was a terrible, terrible feeling to the to the world and certainly uh, people in our country that I know of there was so much commentary about when Mel passed away Warner Brothers did a marvelous big picture showing all the characters being so sad because Mel was gone the captions said speechless and certainly the world did lose somebody wonderful when he passed away. People were, felt really bad that he had passed away, but because of his public persona and what he gave to people and how he really made people laugh, there, there was this sadness mixed with a kind of appreciation and love and celebration. No more to drink. I had a cellar full, but now it's gone. Clink, clink. Mel Blanc has been known for decades as the man of a thousand voices. But he was much more than that. Busty. Oh, brother. His body of work spans more than 1,000 cartoon performances alone. 
His work in radio, television, film, and commercials is still being discovered every day. He is one of the pillars of entertainment, an artist whose skills were so versatile that he couldn't be defined, an actor whose talents can still be marveled at today. crashed a recording session when I was 14. I, I called him up at home, and during the course of the conversation, I found out where he was working that week, and I crashed the session. I told the receptionist that we were guests of Mel Blanc, and I told his producer that we were friends with the receptionist. And, and I watched him work, and I'm looking through that glass at the studio, and, and he's just sitting on a chair very much like this in a, a double-breasted suit, and watching him be Porky Pig, it was like if a, if a kid's idol growing up was Hank Aaron, it was seeing Hank Aaron work, you know, it was, it was, it was watching my idol work. He was amazing. He was just incredible. It was like that painting, you know, where like God is reaching down like this and man is like this and, and they're trying to find that differential. That was what it was like seeing him. You know, it's like this guy isn't of this earth. The voice actors nowadays that really worship what he did, I can understand that because he had it all. And he was the first he truly was a pioneer, and as I say, the, the first multi-voice person, and still in many ways, has never been topped. That's how good he was, without even knowing why he was good. He was a unique, marvelous, one-of-a-kind one voice artist. The top voice in the history of animation, no doubt about it. And uh, uh, every character will be known forever. Nobody will ever top. Mel, the best they can do is imitate him. It is a, an extraordinary career, uh, and the strange thing is I still can't put a face to it. You think of the voices. Lon Chaney was the man of a thousand faces. Mel Blanc, man of a thousand voices. Of the 20th century communications, an era that produced so many remarkable performers, Mel Blanc has to be, as far as Americans are concerned, has to be in the top five of, of all-time actors, if you really want to sit down and think about it. Let's take a cartoon that's on, or a, a, an animated feature or something, and the, the characters that are playing the main characters, the stars of today, and listen to them, watch the, 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 the film, and say, geez, that was really great. Play a clip of Mel Blanc and see the difference. See the difference. My dad's legacy is laughter. He wanted to make people feel good and laugh out loud. The thing I miss most about my dad is my dad and his personality, being the great father, listening to me, never doubting me, asking good questions, being great to my mom. The fact that he was such a, a marvelous human being, not only to the world, but to his family, that's what I remember most. Well, had the contribution that will always survive because young people who were not born yet will be enjoying the work that Mel Blanc has done. I can turn his voice on any time and see one of the cartoons so I can really bring him back to life at any time I want to. I hear his voice every day. Doctors all say is good for your condition. But how can you relax and be quiet when there goes the ignition? Big Bear Lake with the motorboats a button. Big Bear Lake, they're a buzzin' and a button. Big Bear Lake with the motorboats a button. Button all day, button all day, button all day. The ear, the ear, the ear, the ear, the ear, that's all, folks.